We're in Galatians 6 today, and I'm calling it Share It and Bear It, or Bear It and, it's Bear It and Share It, okay, get it right, Ray. Bear It and Share It. (laughs) You know, the other day I was walking around in my backyard and just doing lawn stuff, and I noticed that the hinges on my storage shed were getting rusty. I'm like, ah, shoot, you know, it's one more thing you got to deal with, so I got to go get some nice new shiny ones, because they're actually falling off. And I got to looking about rust. All of us on the Gulf Coast, we understand rust. There's a lot of rust happening right now when you got your free car wash on the way to church today. But I read that rust corrosion costs the world about $2.5 trillion per year around the world. It's very, very expensive. And when it costs that much, you know, that demands we find a way to do something about it. And it's not just buying cans of (laughs) WD-40. There is... um, Scientists have developed what's called a sacrificial anode. And then put up that first picture, please. You see that ship right there? That's under a ship. Those little things stuck all over it are called sacrificial anodes. And what these things do is, like I said, they they place them all over and it keeps the corrosion off the ship. Now, I don't understand the... The, the, the science of it exactly, but I guess the best way I can explain it is you think about how a battery works. It has a positive and a negative side to it. And so a sacrificial anode, it is this alloy that you put, let's say in the case of a ship, you put this metal alloy, alloy on the ship and it has more of a negative electrochemical potential to it than what the metal of the ship has. And so when you put it on the ship, when you place it on the hull, some kind of, I don't really get it, process gets activated. Ask a scientist that knows better than me. And what will happen is that sacrificial anode will bear the burden. It will take all the corrosion upon itself that would have attacked the ship's hull. And it keeps the ship's hull intact. And the anode is the one that gets eaten down by the salt water. But... For this to work, you have to place the anode alongside the ship. It doesn't work if the anodes are sitting at the anode warehouse somewhere miles away from the ship factory, okay? It doesn't work. You have to put them together. And you're going to see a lot of parallels in the body of Christ. You've got to be in the body of Christ. I was talking to friends of mine on the radio on the way over here that were not in any church at all. What are you talking about today, Ray? Sacrificial anodes. You ever dealt with those? Oh yeah, we deal with them in chemical plants all the time. And I'm like, what happens if you don't put it on that? Well, it doesn't do any good. And I'm like, okay, you want to see me at two o'clock? No, I got better things. Okay. Tell me about that anode again. (laughs) I was trying to make the parallel. I'm not sure if they got it, but anyway, um, you have to put them together or it's not going to work. But if you put them together, the sacrificial anode will bear the burden of the corrosion and not the ship. And that's why they put them on there the way they do. You you might even see somebody with a little fishing boat in their backyard. Next time you look at somebody's fishing boat, look down around the engine somewhere, you'll see a piece of metal stuck to the side of something there. It looks like it has no business being there. That's a sacrificial anode that's supposed to take, it's supposed to bear the burden. Keep that in mind. Father, if we come before you in your word, uh, Lord God is well or not well, I may deliver this. Lord, you bring the understanding and we'll leave it with you. Thank you, Father, for what you're going to do today. And bless this new church, whatever you're going to do with it, Lord God. Bless them and bless us together. We're going to reach a whole lot more people. Thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm. Okay, Galatians 6. He says brethren means he's talking to believers still, okay? And remember, the Galatians are not Jews. They're Gentiles. So when he calls them brethren, he's saying they're believers, all right? They just slipped up a little bit. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Okay, I've already made a disclaimer to some people before. I'm going to say it again. I did not tailor 
I'm not looking at nobody. I did not tailor this message for you. Now, I know I've talked to some people about things before. He's saying that about me. I'm not, okay? I've got experience in the matter, but I'm not targeting anybody. So if I happen to look at you while I'm talking, don't shrink back and turn red and all that that people do. It's where we are in the book, okay? So when somebody is overtaken, it means that their run got slow and they got distracted or the sin could catch up to them. I could read you the story of the tortoise and the hare, okay? The, the rabbit got distracted and cocky and whatever, and he, he didn't maintain his focus. He was overtaken by the tortoise. He caught up to him. And so a sin catches up to them. But never sharply punish people. Don't shoot your wounded. Never harshly punish people when they get overtaken because this can and does happen to every one of us. All of us. Especially me. Oh, not the pastor. You're above us. Uh, 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 uh. Don't, don't go that way. It can happen to all of us. But let me show you how they used to deal with people. Why Paul had to say what he said. John 8 verse 3. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him, Jesus, a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. You notice they didn't bring the man. Okay, whatever. They brought her. So instead of being gentle and loving with her, they made a public spectacle out of her. They ridiculed her in front of everybody. That's not the way to do it. Paul himself had firsthand experience in this kind of thing in Acts 21, verse 27. Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, not to pray for him. This is grabbing him, kind of laying hands. Laid hands on him, crying out, men of Israel, help. This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people and the law. They also accused him of taking Gentiles into the part of the temple where the Jew, only the Jews were supposed to be. He never did that. But Paul never did all that stuff that they accused him of. But you can see how the normal way of dealing with these pathetic sinners was to stir up an angry mob of people and publicly humiliate them for it. That's why they crucified Jesus in public. They didn't do it private in a little room tucked away. They put him up on a hill where the whole town could watch. Okay? That's how they dealt with it. So Paul told us to restore a person the right way. And the word restore that he used here, that is a Greek word that could be used when talking about resetting a broken bone or mending a fishing net. You got to be delicate with these things. Okay? So in the, it, it, let's say somebody breaks their leg. You don't grab them by the arm and make them run into a hospital. You throw them on a gurney bed or you put them in a wheelchair and you handle them delicately because you care. You go easy with them to get them to a place where they could be restored. We should re- restore people with gentle care. It's not right like the world. You see the news. Somebody messes up this much and man, they're going to rake him over the coals over the internet and then the news and all. They still do it today. That's not the way a Christian's supposed to do this. Paul said that this task, though, of restoring people is only to be done by you who are spiritual, he said. Meaning those who are mature in their faith. Leave that to them. Mature believers, they have already had their own share of mistakes. They have messed up before. Trust me, I have done plenty of my own, okay? They already know how it feels if you don't treat people right. They've been on that side of it before. It doesn't feel good. They're going to be more patient with how to restore someone. Now, I've never broken a bone in my life. But for those of you who have, you know firsthand what it feels like. And so if you're helping somebody with a broken bone, you know very well what they're going through. I don't understand that. So I'm not mature in that aspect, see. Also, I'm not the guy you want help from if you ever break a bone. If somebody breaks a bone, don't bring them to me. You take them to the doctor. You take them to somebody that's got experience in dealing with this, that knows how to deal with it. Because I don't. The doctor is disciplined. He's refined. He's got experience in dealing with that sort of thing that I don't possess. 
So when someone is overtaken by a trespass, Paul said, leave them to those that know what they're doing. To those who have experience in the faith, spiritual people. You know, I think it's kind of like a car. A five-year-old, you don't let them drive a car. They theoretically know how. You sit in here and turn this wheel and push that pedal, but they don't have the experience to do it. A car is too much power for a five-year-old. They will hurt somebody. You don't put them in the driver's seat. You only let experienced drivers get in the driver's seat. And so a second layer of his warning here, Paul said, he, he told those who are spiritual that before you can work on someone else, Okay, okay, first off, not everybody can help restore somebody. That's for those who are spiritual, as we said. But now for those spiritual, he said, before you do it, consider yourself, lest you be tempted. So we're, we're like three layers into this now. Okay, it's not everybody. It's only the spiritual. And now the spiritual, you better look at yourself first before you get into this. <laughs> I'm glad he said that. We got a good structure going here. If you're, if you're the, the mature guy or woman that's about to help somebody, you are to reflect on your own trespasses. And I know you got them. Don't tell me you don't. (laughs) You reflect on the things you've done wrong before you get in with them because you have to reflect on yourself about how someone else had been gentle with you. There's been times I messed up. People were not gentle with me. And I know that is not the way I like to be treated. So I'm not going to do them. Paul said, consider yourself first. This will keep you humble enough to maintain patience. you got to have patience to deal with people that have made a mistake. I remember recently, my grandson, of course, everything I've done with my grandson was recently because he's only three years old, but (laughs) recently my grandson was trying to do something I told him not to do. But he just continued to challenge me on it because he wanted to do it, and he was really testing me. And buddy, I'll tell you, sometimes I have a fuse, man. It's short. (laughs) I felt that anger coming up in me real quick. But then suddenly, I considered myself. Like Paul said, consider yourself. Unless you're tempted to just go off on somebody. So I was about to blow, and I considered myself. I remembered the times when I was being a hardhead myself. So I took a deep breath, and I exhaled. (laughs) <laughs> and we worked it out calmly. And my grandson still today loves his baba, which I understand in Russian means grandmother. But the Polish, but the Polish have told me it means grandpa, so I've, I'm redeemed, okay? <laughs> so we're good. Um, but what was funny is after that, and Reed went on his way, and I'm like, thank God. The Lord was like... <laughs> Now you know how it feels, right? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I guess I know how it feels now. But it's experiential. See, you have experience. And the more experience you get in this, the better your patience and your humility is going to be. That's why Paul said, let those who are spiritual deal with restoring someone. Because the people that haven't got this level of experience, this track record, they can't handle it. I'll tell you right now, Anna is be- and Joanna, I would say too, are better with children than I am because I never raised any. I met Stevie when he was already a few years old. He's, I don't have that. And I, I felt it with my grandson the other day. And I get to a point, Anna, get in here. <laughs> you know, because I don't have that level to work on him like, I, like she does. And Paul's saying the same thing with restoring a person, let the spiritual do it. But even the spiritual, you have to review yourself. And so if you are not on that level, those who are not on that level, they're too conceited to remember their own mistakes. I get around a lot of people that think that they're better than everybody else. I'd never do that. Oh, that trespass that caught up to you, what were you thinking? I would never have done that. Wasn't looking at you, Mike. I actually I was, but whatever. You ever heard that before? It doesn't feel good. That is, that is immature faith. So Paul said, it's not your job to try to restore someone if you don't have that level of discernment yet. Leave it to those with more experience. Galatians 6, 2. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now, bearing a burden with someone is like saying, hey, buddy, you're not in this by yourself. 
I know you feel like you are, but I'll be with you in it. I'll, we'll go together in this. And though it's only the job of the mature to restore someone, it's only the job of the spiritual to restore, it is the job of all of us, the full body of Christ, to bear one another's burdens together. Bearing burdens together. That's why you're in here. I can, I, I can see that a lot of people value the fellowship they have here. The full body of Christ is to bear one another's burdens. All of us. Whether you are a seasoned, experienced, long-running Christian or not, or if this Christian walk is a totally new thing for you, all of us together are to pray and encourage those who are going through a time and those who are overtaken. But when, restore, when restoration comes, that is critical business. You send those to the mature spiritual people. Now, if you have walls built up around you, again, I'm not focusing on anybody because I've caught myself doing this too. If you have walls built around you because you don't trust people, and this was recent with me, I, had, I discovered this. If you've got these walls bur- uh, around you, you're actually not letting people get close to you. Remember, those anodes were put on the ship. Okay? You got them all. I don't trust anybody. I don't trust churches. I'll let you get so close, but not closer than that. I don't trust anybody. How's that anode going to work on that hull if you can't get it on there? That's why we're supposed to bear with you and share with you together. You got to take that wall down. Ask the Lord, Lord, I got this wall up. How do I take it down? You got to be willing to do that. Paul said that when we do this, Bearing together, sharing together, it fulfills the law of Christ. That sounds great. I want that. But what is it? (laughs) What is the law of Christ? John 13, 34. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's how you love one another. I'm going to have a mess hit me from time to time. Sometimes I always am one. You're going to have a mess. But don't think that degrades you. Don't think that makes you less. Or if I tell it to the church, they're going to think bad of me. No, we're all like that. And if you've messed up as much as me, maybe you could do a ministry one day too. I don't know. I think there's reasons why the Lord put me where I'm at. Because I'm like Peter. I've messed up. But if you you barrier everybody off, that activation is not going to happen when we put that anode on your hull. It's not going to work. This is how God operates with our fellowship. And I know that everybody here today, you got to be doing a self-review. Maybe you're thinking of walls you need to tear down. Uh, Maybe you're thinking of ways how you could better be of a better help to somebody that you know that needs restoring. You know, when you look at, when you're looking at what the Bible's showing us here, it causes me to reflect, why do I have this problem? Like the problems I deal with, you know that God does His best work in our weakness? It says that. So you ever wonder why you have a problem? Really, in that sense, these these challenges, it brings us closer into fellowship with other believers. So man, I really have a need. I'm going to get closer to Dove than I had ever been. Or Pat understands, I'm going to get closer to Pat with this one. Look at the fellowship that it drives. See? Now, I I had some pictures of other ships with anodes that had like one or two anodes. I wanted a picture that had a bunch of them, okay? That ship had good fellowship with anodes. (laughs) You need good fellowship with the body of Christ. Closer fellowship. Problem hits, restore them, you bear your burdens with them, and then you look at the fruit that gets produced from all this. It's actually very beneficial. So maybe, and I was thinking this for myself, you can go with it if you want. I thought maybe instead of me concentrating on nothing but my problem and letting that beat me up even more, maybe I should be concentrating on the Lord and each other in the body of Christ and let that serve its function to help my fellowship with one another. That's me owning the problem rather than the problem owning me, so to speak. So you realize there are people that are suffering around you that need your fellowship and to deny them fellowship because you have either your wall around you 
or by your refusal to walk spiritually in obedience to God, that causes you to miss out. See, I'm going to have fellowship in this body whether some people let it happen or not. I'm going to have it, but are you letting it happen? I've talked to people about their walls. I've talked to people about their struggles. And maybe I don't understand what you're going through. Maybe I haven't been through it. But I know one thing. There's somebody in this body that does. And for me to restore, we've got to break that wall down and get you closer into the unity that, this, that the Lord is trying to work on you with. The unity in the body of Christ that maybe you've been rejecting. You didn't know you were doing it. So don't deny others your fellowship. Don't deny yourself great miracles by letting all this go to waste. You know, we live in a divided world, and we're programmed for that. You mess with me, we're done. Two people mess with me, I'm done with everybody. (laughs) We're programmed for that, and the world is teaching us that, and that is ungodly. It is actually against fellowship, and we are pre-programmed by our culture to reject this chapter. And you're going to have to, and I am going to have to, and I have all week had to swallow a lot of humble pie to get this chapter in me. I've had a lot of dealings that I've had to get this chapter in me. So let's, I say we use Galatians 6. I say we gain from it. I say we follow it because this is the formula for God's blessing. You know, the Bible's good stuff, isn't it? It's just good stuff, and I love it. Galatians 6 and 3. For if anyone thinks himself to be something, look at that, that's everybody today, most everybody, when he is nothing, he deceives himself, but let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another, for each one shall bear his own load. Okay, this seems a little contradictory to what we just read. It's really not. (laughs) This is a self-review command here. It's necessary for us because there's a lot of people today, they're out there trying to correct other people, and quite honestly, they shouldn't be doing it because they're a mess themselves. It's like the blind leading the blind. You can't do that. It doesn't work. Being conceited, I can do no wrong. I'm so great. I would have never done what you did. That person's never going to help you. Being conceited, I'm perfect. I've never done what you did. I'm better than you are. When you look down on others as though you're better than them, then that's what causes people to be way too aggressive and hostile. And that's exactly what the Pharisees did to that woman caught in adultery. That's now the problem. I'm too good. I'm something. And Paul says, you're not. (laughs) Um... Again, they didn't bring the man that she committed adultery with, so that was very one-sided. I thought, why not make a spectacle out of that man too? It's see how biased it was, how cheating and lying it was. So it's wrong. So in order to be a burden bearer along with somebody, you have to set aside your conceit. What you think makes you so great and awesome. Humble down a little bit. Review yourself. Take a look at, remember what you did wrong. How somebody treated you harshly versus somebody that treated you very well and man i like the way that was treated well i think that's the way i need to help this person now you're starting to build up your maturity into that spiritual person okay being conceited is the belief that you've done nothing anything wrong and that you're incapable of doing anything wrong and that line of thinking will cause somebody to be intolerant of other people's mistakes I'm not tolerating what you did for one minute and you will bash them and you will hurt them. Conceit causes other people to push on them with that, you ever heard suck it up buttercup? I've heard that. I've heard that in my family. That's the kind of discussion that conceited tough guys like to spout, but it never helped anybody's restoration. That never helped anybody out. It only makes people resentful. And then you just help them build their wall. Here's another brick. Add to it. So instead of comparing yourself to those who need restoration, it's a godly move to step outside of your box and take a look back at yourself. I kind of do that thing. Step out the box like here's the all-encompassing Ray Jensen here. Sometimes I have to go step out and go, 
Oh, goodness. Yeah, I didn't notice that. Or like when you hear your own recording on the radio, that's me, I sound like that. Or when you see yourself on the video camera, gosh, I look like that. <laughs> you, know? you step outside of yourself and look. So you can see all the great things that God has done for you throughout your lifetime to see all the times that you have been restored when you were in error. And then you can have rejoicing in yourself alone, which means you can be joyful in what God has done to restore you. I was a mess. I did a lot of things. Those that you have known my testimony, I can rejoice in myself, not that I'm independent of the body of Christ, but I can rejoice in what the Lord God has done in me. I'm not the guy I used to be. And then you will be more patient dealing with other people. Paul said in Romans 12, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to. So conceit, that causes people to think they're too good to sin, and such people like that are not fit to try to restore anybody. It's just damaging. So when Paul said, each shall bear his own load in verse 5, like I said, it seems like a contradiction to verse 2, what we've been talking about, which says for us to bear one another's burdens. It's different than verse 2. Verse 2 is dealing with the heavy, crushing loads that's too heavy for any one person to carry on their own. You've been struck with things that's too heavy for just you to carry, that you couldn't carry it by yourself. Those are the loads that we have to bear with them, the big burdens. That's the ones we get together with you on. But in verse 5, the word load there is a Greek word that means like a soldier's backpack. That's not too hard for you to carry. You can carry that, okay? Don't mistake somebody's load for being a backpack to being a crushing weight. Don't mistake that. Suck it up. It's just a backpack. Maybe that's a crusher to them. But you, this is you reviewing yourself. I can do this. This I can do. But the stuff you can't, you need to confess it up with the, the body of Christ. So it means like a soldier's backpack. It's not too heavy to carry. There are certain responsibilities that the Lord has assigned to each believer, responsibilities that you have to carry that you can't share with everybody else. It's something for you to do. The Lord called me to be a pastor right here. All of you have not. Dove is going to go do another church, okay? But you have not been called to be the pastor of this church. That's mine. That's my backpack to carry. Now, I have things that I confide with y'all in that are, that are bigger, heavier things that we all deal with together. And I thank you for your fellowship. It helps me out. We bear that together. But this pastoring thing, that's my backpack. And I will wear it, Okay. Jesus, though, I want you to see this. Jesus said this in Matthew eleven thirty. 30. He said, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's not too much for you to carry. So what Paul was getting at here is that instead of getting conceited in ourselves, look how awesome I am. Instead of doing that, we need to review the work that God has done in us so that we can have joy in how the Lord has restored us from our sins so that we can gently and help and help and lovingly help bear the burdens of others when they are overtaken by a crushing weight. Friends, my being a pastor is not a crushing weight. If it was, you'd know it. And you'd say, we can't follow this guy because he ain't cutting it. But I can because the Lord enables me to do it. But if I go out and have some major catastrophe smack me in my life, Thank you that all of you are here to bear with me in that crushing load. You see the difference? So we can rejoice in how the Lord has restored us from our sins so that we can gently help burdens of others when they are overtaken by a crushing weight. You cannot do that kind of work when you are all full of yourself. It's when you're conceited. Galatians 6, verse 6. Let him who is taught the word... Share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. It has been now almost nine years, and I'm finally to this verse that I have been trying to figure out how I'm going to preach it when it ever hits me, and I have now arrived to it. And Dove is already laughing. <laughs> okay. This is one of those interesting passages that's a whole lot easier to say at another church where you're a guest speaker at rather than your own. But here it is, 
bear with me, bear my burden, okay? <laughs> so, interesting. Most people, they know this reap what you sow verse. You know, everybody knows that one. Okay. They also know that God is not mocked verse. You hear that plucked and thrown, you know, I've heard it a number of times. But most people don't know the verse that comes right before it, which is why I read these two verses together. <laughs> Lord help me. I read them together for a reason. Um, the biblical responsibility for every believer is to financially support the pastor and the teachers in their church. That's what it says. Okay. It's likely that the Galatian people, when they were backsliding, they stopped supporting their pastor. And Paul was there to correct them of this. And so part of Paul's instruction to them was you should be paying your pastor for his work. He reprimanded them for taking up all the benefits and the blessings of the pastor's work to preach the word to them and to bless them. They were taking it, but they were not reciprocating the fruits of their work back to him. And I would probably say there were some starving pastors in Paul's day. There are starving pastors today around the world. Some of them I communicate with. Because their people say, praise God, amen, they leave, and they don't share in all good things with him who taught. They took the blessing, but they didn't return it. Now, for me personally, when God called me to ministry, it required a very, very tough decision. And, I, and Dove was talking to me about it, and I said, you're going to have to give me a couple few days to pray on this one. Because this isn't just something you just flip on like a TV set, okay? I had to leave my career in radio. It was something that I had spent 20 years of my life building up. That was my income. That was my living. And it scared me to leave it because I had a lot of benefits and, you know, the position and the title and all. I could hire and fire and I could make decisions and I could go out and do things. And it was just a lot going. It took a lot of experience to get to that level. But I don't know, Dove, if you're aware of this, but what scared me even more than leaving my job was all the friends that I had around me that said, oh, Ray, just trust in the Lord. He'll provide. Just have faith in God. When I knew that they were not giving to the ministry that they were being blessed by. That's what scared me more than leaving the career itself. They'd say, oh, well, I'd ask them about giving it because it brought us into a discussion because I, I was really trying to feel them out. Who are these people I'm listening to that's telling me to just, oh, just trust in God. And I knew that, but what, what are you giving? Well, I, I can't afford it right now. Well, the house note's too high. Well, I, I need to get a car and I, I, I just bought a new uh, entertainment system. And uh, all these million justifications on why they don't give. And I'm about to quit my career and go to do this pastor work. Am I going to get a church full of people that's going to say the same thing outside the walls? I can't afford to give. And that's how I'm supposed to be making my income when I'm going to leave this career. It scared me, guys. It freaked me out. I had to learn, yeah, trust in the Lord without their telling me. See, they were scaring me, though. It scared me that if the church would be filled, because you know, I, I don't see the snapshot, I didn't see the snapshot then that I have now. I have y'all now, don't, don't take me wrong. I, I know y'all, I love y'all, y'all give, I know it, it comes in, I see it, okay, thank you. But at the time, I was afraid I was about to leave my income to go give to those who would not share back with their income. That's what scared me. So while I was struggling with the decision to leave and go into full-time ministry, I was surrounded by the just trust in God crowd, and they'd stick their chest out with pride and they'd over-spiritualize their talk, just trust in God. I see y'all, some of y'all with a look on your face like you've been there, but they weren't backing up what they were saying, were they? They over-spiritualized. They, they were telling me to trust in God with my part but they were not trusting in God with their part. So 
I had to put my faith in the Lord for real. And I'll be honest, it, it was those people that had made it a lot more difficult for me to finally arrive to that decision to go into full-time ministry. They made it so much harder for me to come to that choice. Uh, so what made you come to the choice, Ray? And I thought, well, you know, I'll tell you, I'll be honest. I, I prayed to the Lord and I said, Lord, you know what? I, thought, I don't know what Dove's going to say about this, but Lord, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to stay at my job and I'm just going to stay where I know the finances are secure. And then the Lord said, well, who says you get to keep your job if you don't do what I call you to? And I went, okay, you got me. <laughs> and there it was. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> So I called up Dove and said, I'm in. Because <laughs> that scared me. That scared me more than the people were doing. So I hope you can see why Paul said that God will not be mocked. God won't be made fun of. He won't be ridiculed. Because if somebody is blessed by the labor of a pastor's work, but then they refuse to share what they have back to him with him who teaches, then they have just mocked the Lord God. There I said it. I finally made it here and I said it. God considers this to be a personal insult against him. To call a man out of everything he knew. Place him in front of people. Bless them and they not bless him back. God says that is a mockery to me. I don't have to deal with it. See, that's what's nice about it for me. I don't have to worry about it. You didn't mock me. Whoever does that, they mock the Lord God. That's between you and Him. I'm staying out of it. So you give what the Lord has you give. I'm clean of that. And it took several years for me to learn this, okay? But it's good, good stuff. But let me be clear. I am very thankful to all of you who give here. And believe me, your generosity does not go unnoticed in this church. But there are a lot of believers out there who just are not faithfully sharing their fair part to support those who teach them, their pastors. I have come to realize this, though. It's not my problem. And I hope any pastors that may hear me or any ministers that are hearing me teaching today realize it ain't your problem either. God will deal with that. And yes, I'm going to tell you, just trust in the Lord and He will provide. <laughs> but I gave it to you with substance. Okay? God will deal with it. I just need to stay true to my calling. You need to stay true to yours. Galatians 6 and 8. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Now there are some farming terms in here. Sowing. Sowing is the act of throwing seed out into the ground so that it will take root and grow there. I have sown seed before with grandpa on the family ranch when I was a kid. And uh, we had a, like a drought that killed off a lot of the grass in his pastures. And so it was time to uh, sow seed. So what happened was, okay, first off, I was very, very young. I was too young for this. So we went and bought hundreds of pounds of grass seed and we put them all in the back of the truck. We drove back to the pasture and grandpa said, now you stand in the back you reach down to get you some grass seed, and I'm just going to drive down the pasture and turn and drive back, kind of like mowing grass, you know, except we're doing the opposite, we're growing it. <laughs> he says, and you throw it, and I threw it, okay, and I'm throwing it, and he stopped the truck, he gets out, and he goes, you're not throwing it right. Well, how am, I, how am I supposed to throw it? He goes, you're throwing it in clumps. You're supposed to throw it where it spreads. We want it to spread. Oh, okay, and I'm, I'm trying, and it just wasn't working right. He goes, okay, he stopped the truck. He goes, you drive. And I was like, I was a kid. I wouldn't, this, I don't know. And I got in the drive, and I couldn't see over the dash. And I remember he was, he was throwing us. I was watching him in the mirror how it spread, and it worked real good. But I just couldn't see over the dash too good. Hardly reached the pedals. His grandpa was like, this ain't working. You know, <laughs> this ain't working. But what was funny is that later when the grass finally showed up, you could see the even grass and the splotchy grass. And I'm like, that's where I did. You know, I could tell. I could tell according to how I showed what we got. Okay. So you're going to get what you sow. How you sow is going to come back. And if you want abundant blessing, spread it out evenly and sow it abundantly and evenly, evenly. But guys, we sowed hundreds of pounds of grass seed. 
A bunch of it. Went up down the pasture all day long. He got somebody to help, me, help him when he realized I couldn't do it very well. We sowed heavily because we expected heavily. I think a lot of people got it backwards today. They expect heavily. They won't sow heavily. Um, how crazy would it be to try to sow acres of pasture land from a bag of grass seed the size of a potato chip bag, like a Doritos bag? You're not going to cover nothing with that. We had the whole truck filled up. I think we went back and bought some more and came back later and did more. We sowed heavy because we expected a lot of return. So to those who won't sow, well, the Lord will provide. Yes, he will, but according to how you sow. Paul said, if you sow to please the Spirit, then the return will be in eternal things. So I, I want to say this. You sow to the Spirit, it comes from the heart, right? What that means is that you don't go sowing to the pastor or to the ministry and expect it all to come back to you financially because the return might be in eternal things or spiritual or non-tangible things see you sow really from your heart more than you do your pocketbook because you might only put a dollar in there but that was what your heart could do like the woman with the 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 mites it wasn't much but she sowed heavily from her heart it was she was joyful in doing it but if you don't sow heavily you're not going to reap back and it may not come back in exactly something you can put your hands on the, the view in here is that how are you giving? Are you giving for eternal things to the Spirit? Which way are you giving? I know a lot of people that think, well, if, if, if I can, okay, well, he's talking about giving. Well, I'll go throw a little money in the, in the bank account. Then I'm going to go sit and wait for that thing that I want. It may not come back like that. So don't get discouraged that it doesn't. It will come back in other blessing ways. You may be spared of something that hit a lot of other people, and that's your blessing. You know, so Paul's point in the last few chapters was that there must be financial support of Christian workers, but that anyone who gave would get eternal spiritual returns for it. You may give X amount of money. You may not see that money ever come back. I don't know. Maybe it will. Depends on the Lord. But don't expect that. You expect with eternal giving how you give. God is not going to be mocked. Galatians 6, 9. Okay, God, I got past it. Let's move on. Woo! I did it. Galatians 6, 9. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. As mentioned before, your return might not come back to you as money. It might not even come back to you for years. It might not even come back in this life. Don't know. So don't get frustrated if it doesn't come back the way you thought it would to where you quit. That's what he's getting at. Don't get tired of doing good. If giving is the right thing you give, irregardless of what you expect, you should be getting back out of it. Because that pastor, that worker, that teacher, those ministry people, they're already giving their best to you from their heart. Don't get frustrated and quit. Paul said, don't get weary. Don't get tired of doing good because it will come back to you. It will in due season. Me and grandpa, we sowed all that seed, but we didn't have grass the next day. We didn't even have it next week. We didn't even have it next month. <laughs> we did all that work. Where's our grass? We can't turn the cows out there to graze. But it did come. In its season, it came. We got that grass. Don't give up because the harvest is a sure thing. It will come. Now, Paul had experienced this kind of frustration because he included himself in this passage. He said, if we, he included himself, if we don't lose heart. He didn't say, if y'all don't lose, uh, Paul's a Texan, if y'all don't lose heart, he said, if we, he included himself, and I'm in it with you, all of us need to keep pushing. I'm telling you, in ministry, there's been a hundred times I wanted to quit. 
Yeah, and the ministers in the room with me are all nod. Yeah, we're there too. Oh no, you're the pastor. You're perfect. No, I'm not. I've wanted to quit. Why do we keep going? Because we know the, that we will return in due season. We know it's going to be better when we get that back in that due season than what we could produce on our own. That's why we keep going. So don't quit. Don't lose heart. It's going to come. And also, let me just further it a little bit. We will also receive fully at the judgment seat of Christ. See, you're never going to get all of it here. You, we will get it before the Lord. That's exciting. The Holy Spirit, God, thank you. So while you're able, I say sow the best you can. Sow the best you can with what you got. Galatians 6.11 See with what large letters I have written to you with my own hand. As many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these would compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For not even those who are circumcised keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. Okay, I kind of see this right here that it's like Paul took the pen away from his scribe. He took it away and he wrote real big in my own hand. Okay, scribe, good work. I'm taking it from here. And he closed with emphasis, with oomph. Paul said that these legalists pushing salvation by circumcision, they were just man pleasers, not God pleasers, because they were afraid that men would persecute them if they taught about Jesus. If, if we do that thing that Paul's doing, they're going to be mad at us, so we don't want to do it. He says they're just scared. They're man-pleasers. Paul said they wanted to boast in your flesh, which means they're trying to get as many circumcision people as they could. They were trying to get the circumcision, the, the numbers, as high as they could so they could brag. Hey, hey, I got 200 circumcised. How many you got? We got 400 at my place. He's saying they're trying to boast in you. They're trying to get you to do this so they can brag about themselves as though it gave them some kind of a religious superiority if my number count is higher than yours. Galatians 6.14 But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. In other words, but a new creation does. It avails you a lot. Your salvation means you have died to this world, he said. This world out there and all its craziness, I'm separate from all that. I'm, this ain't home no more, okay? I'm just passing through. What's going on in the world, the best that the world has out there. Think of what you think, consider to be the best that the world's got. That is nothing in comparison to what the kingdom of God has for you. Nothing at all. A lot of people brag about how much money they have. I heard this guy, oh, I live in this big mansion by the ocean. And it sounds very awesome. But it's like, you know, I think, you know, I, I got a mansion in heaven that makes yours like a cardboard box. Know what you've got ahead of you. If you want to brag, then brag in what you have in Jesus Christ is what Paul's saying. And I used to do a lot of driving for AAA when I did radio work, and I would see these houses on these hills, and I'm like, man, look at that. Stop it. My mansion in heaven's better than that. <laughs> it's like an eye bounce that I had to do. Don't do that. Galatians 6, 16. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and let upon the Israel... Let me reread that. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. He had in his body the marks of the Lord Jesus. He had something on him that showed everybody. I walk with Christ, man. Do you? Do you have anything that if I look at you, because a bunch of you, I know you. I'm talking to people out there that don't know you. Can they look at you and see something about you that says, That's a, that guy follows the Lord? Can they see that? 
Now, Paul's blessing here was both for Jews and Gentiles alike because he said, as many as those who walk according to this rule. As many, whoever. Jew, Gentile alike. Um, He said that as many as walk according to this rule. And what rule was that? The rule is that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, not by circumcision, not by anything else, not by how many circumcised we have, not by how many members are in this church, not by how many dollars you put in the giving, not by how big your car is or how big your house is, none of that. That is not the rule. It's salvation through crucified Jesus Christ by faith alone, receiving His grace. That is it. Those who walk according to that rule alone. And notice how Paul said the Israel of God. That's what got me. He didn't say the God of Israel. (laughs) He said the Israel of God. And I went, what? (laughs) So I had to look at that. Paul knew there were Jews that were both believing and unbelieving. There were Jews that did not have faith. They were pushing circumcision. And there were Jews that believed who pushed faith through Jesus Christ. And so what that meant was that only those Jews who believe by faith, they are the true Israelites of God. So he said the Israel of God. He's talking about real Jews that believed in salvation the right way. I'm reminded of when Jesus said to Nathaniel, he said, you remember what he said? He said, here's a true Israelite. That's a real Israelite right there. Meaning, he recognized that he could see that Nathaniel had true faith in him. So when I see that what Paul said there, the Israel of God, he's talking about real believing Jews. So now, in closing, we need to be attentive and very careful about how to restore someone who is overtaken by a trespass because it can and it will happen to any one of us at any time. It really can. Matthew seven twelve. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law. You know, the Pharisees made a mockery out of that adulteress, and they they did a lot to Paul as well. They ridiculed him. None of you liked that. She didn't like it. Paul didn't like it. If you want people to treat you well, then you treat them well first. Not well, no, they straighten up, then I will. Uh Uh-uh. Christ died for us while we were still sinners. You treat them right first if you want that back. If you don't like being mocked, then don't mock the Lord. You don't like being ridiculed and insulted, then don't insult the Lord. Share in all good things with Him who teaches. See, this is how you build people up. This is how you build up the body of Christ. Hebrews 5.13, For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Okay. Exercised. I, it wouldn't take a whole lot of time at the gym for me to take part in the Mr. Olympia. I'm close to it. I'm just giving you an example of what exercise looked like. All right. Don't laugh too hard. But if you need to be restored from a trespass, bring it to the church leadership. Come talk to me. Come talk to one of us here. Don't air your laundry out on social media. Don't run to the people whose their lives are a mess and share it with, well, they're my friends. They can't restore you. Don't take it to unbelieving friends simply because you're scared to tell the church. That's a big one. Well, I'm afraid if my pastor finds out what I'm dealing with, he's going to look down on me. You think after Galatians 6, I'm going to do that to you? I'm going to treat you the way I want to be treated. So when you've got these things, bring it. Bring it to us and let us help you. Okay? Don't keep it a secret. That's that wall. Don't build that protective shell around yourself. Okay. Imagine if a shipbuilder If a shipbuilder put a wall around a ship and they told the security guys, let no anode people come in here. We're going to launch the ship. No anodes get put on the side of that. Now you remember how all those anodes were put along that ship, right? If you build a wall around yourself and you won't let us bear and share with you, 
then you're refusing the body of Christ. You are refusing to allow the body of Christ to come alongside you and bear the burden with you, or else you will bear it alone. And if you bear it alone, you will corrode. And after you corrode, you will sink. I want to show you what a sacrificial anode looks like after it has finished its job. Show me that picture. Not much left of them. They're eaten down to pretty much nothing. Nothing left at this point. They were strategically placed all over the hull. They literally became part of the ship. And only then were they able to bear all that destruction in order to save the ship. And then after they do their job, they're used up, and they throw the anodes away. Let me show you another, what another one looks like after it has finished its job. And at that point, there was nothing left to him either. But remember how the anodes were placed all over the ship's hull. They were purposely put there by somebody that saw great value in the ship by someone that really wanted to keep that ship safe. We have been covered by the sacrificial blood of Christ. And His blood was purposely put all over us by Father God because He sees your great value. He really wants to keep you safe. I showed this to Russ the other day. He said, that is so Galatians 6. <laughs> bear it and share it, guys. If you share it, he'll bear it. But you've got to allow yourself to be placed in Jesus alongside this body, this church body of Christ, with us together before it will work. Let Jesus take all of sin's corrosive destruction upon Himself to save you. Now, after sacrificial anodes are used up, they take them off and they throw them away. After Jesus died on the cross, they took Him down and they buried Him away. But sacrificial anodes don't rise again. Jesus did. You'll be